All right, good morning, Three Circle. Great to be with you today as we continue the battle series. I want to welcome all of our campuses right now and those joining us online. Uh, We're going to dive in again. Let me just remind you of why we're doing a series called Battles. Here's what I know about all of us. We're all fighting battles of some kind, some private, some public, um, but we're all going to face battles. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of this present darkness. So this life is a wrestling match. And, and what we've done during this series is we've looked at battles that we fight spiritually, like the battle for the heart and the battle for the mind. And then we are looking at real battles that took place in the Bible to show us how God interacts with his people. So as fun as this series can be, these battles all could be a movie really made about them. But the primary reason for studying these battles in the Bible is not to learn about the battles. The primary reason is that God is revealing himself to us through these stories, through these battles. We learn a lot about God. We learn a lot about our relationship with God. And today we're going to look at a king who faced a mighty battle, and his name is Jehoshaphat. Um, And to give you a bit of a history lesson uh, without giving you too deep of one, because we could talk about the history of how we got to this point with the people of, of God, I'm going to give you a brief one, okay? So the kingdom was split between the north and the south, and we had Judah and Israel. And Jehoshaphat's going to be one of the kings of Judah, still God's people. He's going to be in Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat is a good king. Now, the people of God had a lot of kings, and some of them were bad, and some of them were really bad. And then a few of them were good. Jehoshaphat is one of the good kings. Now, he is not a perfect king because none of them were. All of them are imperfect, and they're going to imperfectly lead. But Jehoshaphat's one of the good guys. And although he's going to make some mistakes as well, all of them did because no earthly king could ever be perfect. They're all pointing to the king of kings who will be perfect. Jehoshaphat's going to be one of the good guys, and we're going to learn from him today. In fact, I'm going to tell you from the outset that we're going to learn today that, the, that there is great power in prayer and in praise. In fact, we're going to see Jehoshaphat pray one of the most beautiful and I would argue one of the most biblical prayers in the entire Bible. And we can learn a lot about how to pray. In fact, he prays almost exactly the way Jesus later on in the New Testament will teach us to pray. That's how he's going to pray today. So with all that in mind, we will dive in and, and realize that Jehoshaphat is, is, is the king of Judah. How did he lead and what was his relationship with God like? Right before we get to the battle that Jehoshaphat's going to be faced with, the Bible says this. We're going to be in Second Chronicles today. We're going to begin in chapter 16 with this verse. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth, the whole earth, to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. Now, I love this verse for a lot of reasons, but when I was a kid, my youth pastor was a big fan. He became my youth pastor when the summer I turned 13. He was amazing, and he loved this Christian artist by the name of Steve Camp. Does anyone in the room or online, do you remember an artist by the name of Steve? I've got just a few because you have to be a true Christian music aficionado to know who Steve Camp is. But Steve Camp in the 80s and 90s was considered kind of the Keith Green of his generation. All his music was deeply theological. My youth pastor loved him, and he had a song based on this verse. So this verse has been burned into my mind and into my heart. But when you do a deep dive into this verse, and by the way, the reason we're reading it is because God told his people these words right before this big battle that they're about to have to fight. Now look at what it says again. It says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. Now if you see God as a tyrant, then you would assume that he's looking throughout the earth to catch you doing something bad. That's why he's looking and inspecting and checking everything out, right? When you're working and you have a bad boss that kind of shows up, looks over your shoulder, that's not a good feeling, isn't it? Uh, so, So if your view of God is... He's tyrant. He's just the big celestial killjoy in heaven looking to make your life hard. Then you will assume that the reason he's looking around is to catch you doing something bad. But that's not what the verse says. It says he's looking throughout the earth to give strong support to those. Let's stop there. So that's really good news. Some, he's looking for someone to give strong support to. Now, I don't know about you, but I would think that when God supports someone, it is very strong. It's a good thing to have God's hand on your life. But who? Who's he looking for? Well, it says here, whose hearts are blameless towards him. Well, there goes that. (laughs) Because I think all of us would collectively say, well, that's not me. Anybody want to raise your hand? How many blameless hearts do we have in the house today? (laughs) Zero. 
So what gives here? And see, if we're not careful, and by the way, if we don't have a good understanding of the gospel, we might would think that what God's looking for is good people, people who've got their act together. Now, he will strongly support them. But when we understand the gospel, again, this is why gospel preaching is so important, because I must lay over the Bible the prism of the gospel. I've got to read the Bible through the prism of the good news. It helps me understand everything in the scriptures. And so when the Bible says here God supports those whose hearts are blameless towards him, we gospel people understand what that means. Because there's only one way for a, for a sinning human being to have a blameless heart, and that is to be blood washed in Christ, to be given a new heart, to become a new creation. And to stand before God blameless means that we've been covered with Christ. That's what this means. And in the Old Testament... Those people were covered by the future sacrifice of Christ by faith. And we now, we are covered by the past sacrifice of Christ by faith. And so when the Bible says here God's looking to support those whose hearts are blameless, that's a gospel verse. It's saying that if you belong to God by faith, he is looking for moments to give you strength, to empower you, to have his hand on you. Now, isn't that good news, church? That's really good news. So I want you to start there. Now, God gives this incredible declaration of his love and his desire to help his people right before a big battle is going to take place. Write these few things down. We get from this verse, God loves to provide for his people. You you learn something about your heavenly father. And this isn't some wheat, watered down, prosperity, gospel-y stuff we're talking about here. No, we're talking about a God who... Who, who saves his people, and now we belong to him, and like any good father, in fact, better than any good father you've ever known. If you had a bad father growing up, don't put that on God. That's not who he is. If you had a great father growing up, don't even put that on him because the greatest father on the planet is going to fall short of who he is. It's unbelievable how good he is. Jonathan Edwards, I read this quote from him recently. He said, with respect to the saints, God's people, There will be no happiness too much for them. God will not begrudge anything as too good for his people. Man, that's who he is. He loves to provide for his people. And then as as kind of a foundation, as we step into our passages for today, you need to know that Jehoshaphat was a good king and he followed God. Imperfectly, he's one of the good guys in this respect. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at how Jehoshaphat led, which is going to teach us some things, and then we're going to look at how he prayed. How did he lead, and how did he pray? And those two things are going to collide here. So the first thing we get when we go to verse 4 through 7 in chapter 19 of 2 Chronicles is we get a look at King Jehoshaphat and who he was. Here's a little insight. It says this, Jehoshaphat lived at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people. So already we get something about this king. He's not aloof. He's out among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim he brought them back to the Lord everybody say that with me he brought them back to the Lord that's the first thing he did as the king Um, he brought them back to the Lord the God of their fathers he appointed judges in the land and all the fortified cities of Judah city by city and he said to the judges consider what you do for you judge not for man but for the Lord He is with you in giving judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do. For there is no injustice with the Lord our God or partiality or taking bribes. Now, I see a lot of things happening here. We get a kind of a look into the leadership of Jehoshaphat. And the first thing we see is his foundation for leadership and how he led Judah was point them to God. In their case, they had started getting a little squirrely about stuff. And he was like, no, 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 we're going to bring that back. God's given me this seat of authority, and I'm going to leverage it to point you back to God. Folks, that's what we should do with any leverage, influence, authority God gives us in this life. If you're a dad, if you're a mom, if you're leading in any way, figure out a way, even if it's just by your actions, to point people to God. So the first thing he does is he's bringing them back to the Lord. And then what I see here is a king who does not just pray and trust God and hope it all works out. He prays, he lays the foundation for the house, but then he begins to do the things that has to be done. He goes city by city in Judah, and he makes sure that he appoints good, strong, godly men to lead. 
And then he gives them very firm instructions. These are judges. They're going to lead these towns, these cities. And he tells them, you better be careful how you lead. He goes city by city. I got a city I'd like for him to go to. I think he could help us. It rhymes with Washington, D.C. I'd like to see him go there. Right? He could roll up in there and let them know, hey, I would be very careful what you do, whether you are an elephant or donkey, whichever team you're on. Be very careful what you do. Act in the fear of the Lord. Now, what we see here is we see active trust being practiced instead of passive trust. I grew up with a little bit of this language again in the church, and you've heard it as well. It's not a denominationally driven thing. It happens in churches all the time where we use language that I get where it comes from. I think it's very well-intentioned, but I think it becomes very problematic, and it's this kind of language. Well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. Okay, I get it. We believe in the sovereignty of God, but let's, let's, just, let's have some scenarios here. Let's say your marriage is falling apart. And you go, well, if God wants us to stay together, I guess we'll stay together. If it's will, if it's his will, it'll happen. You know what that's called? It's called a cop-out. That's lazy. Because what you should do is say, Lord, I pray. But it was his will for your marriage to make it when you said, I do. I'm sorry. So it's time for us to pull the exit signs down and start going, Lord, I made this commitment and this covenant, and we need to work on it. Y'all follow me here? And, and, and so, so what we do often is we just kind of use the cop out. We play the God card. Well, if he wants it to happen, no, what you do is you go, I pray over my marriage, but I'm not going to be passive about it. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to do the things God's told me to do. I'm going to use every resource he's given me to use and blessed me to use, whether that's great counseling, whether that's uh, a, a marriage retreat, whether that's going to see a spiritual advisor, whatever that looks like, we're going to take some action, right? So I need to pray. If I want to have a good marriage, I need to pray, and then take out the trash. You know what I'm saying? There's an action. I need to pray and be nice. Let's start there. Pray and not be mean. But let's not just be passive, and too many of us are. We just, we just pray, well, maybe it'll work out. Well, why don't we do the things that God's put in our hands to do, given us to do? And so what we see here is a king who says, God, you are foundational. We pray. I want you to bless our nation. I'm going to lead this nation, but then I'm going to, I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to pick good people. Then I'm going to tell them how to lead. This is what good leadership looks like. It is active. Let me give you this as we approach the election season in just a few weeks. I'm going to tell you a deep held belief of mine, and it's this, and this has always been our focus here. We are focused on making disciples. I want Three Circle Church to be an incubator that just rolls out disciples, okay? Because here's what I believe. I believe that if we teach you to be a disciple, we don't have to talk you into giving and being generous. We don't have to talk you into uh, uh, going to be missional in your life and caring about the lost. We don't have to do any of those things because guess what? Disciples give, Disciples are generous. Disciples care about lost people. Disciples want to serve people. So, so you know what else I really believe? I believe disciples vote. I do. I believe that disciples care. I believe we care, but we're not scared. You with me on that? We're going to live that way, okay? So I just want to encourage you. You should be involved. A, a good-thinking Christian should be very involved. You should be thinking and praying about and discerning and looking at things and my goodness, don't think that whatever the outcome is is going to be the answer to really much of anything. You need to understand your answer is in the Lord. Your king is Jesus. Your kingdom is heaven. Amen, right? But that doesn't mean we don't care. We care deeply because we're not passive people. We're active people. We care deeply. We may care more than anyone else because we hopefully see more clearly than those without Christ would. And so we see here a king who says, I trust God and I work. I trust God and I do everything I know to do. And that's how he's leading here. And, and here's what I want to show you because you learn so much in these stories. So here's a king doing it right. He is leading strong. He's setting up godly people to lead well. He, the, the country flourishes under his strong, wise leadership. So you would think that if he's doing everything God wants him to do, that God's just going to bless and bless and bless. Because isn't that a little deal we make with the man upstairs? If I do what you want me to do, then you're going to just, everything's going to be great, right? It's going to be puppies and roses and 
all things good. If you don't like dogs, then that wouldn't be a good thing, but maybe ice cream, whatever, whatever your thing is. And that's not what happens. Because as Jehoshaphat is leading so well, so wisely, so faithfully, he's doing everything you would think to be blessed. There is a battle brewing, a big battle. Not one, not two, but three kingdoms, three armies are coalescing together to fight him, to come at him. And and this is where we learn about the battles. Because the truth is, if you walk with Jesus, all of hell has been unleashed against you, against everything that you stand for. You need to be aware of that. And here's the trick. The thing we've learned throughout this battle series is this. The battles actually can be the blessing. Because the battles we fight teach us to follow God. They show us who we are. They reveal things. Your character's not made in the battle. It's revealed in the battle. And then you're able to see what you need to focus on, what you need to work on. So the battles we fight grow us and change us. And what we see is that Jehoshaphat, well, he's a good king and he's leading well, but there's a battle coming that's going to define his entire kingdom. It says in 2 Chronicles 21 through 4, after this, after what? After Jehoshaphat did so well. After he's done everything God wants him to do, here's what happens. The Moabites and the Ammonites and with them some of the Meunites, they came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you. This is personal, coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. A few things I see here. Number one, the principle is in play. We will fight battles, and do not be surprised by them. Jehoshaphat has done everything It seems that he should be doing, and yet a battle is coming at him. That's how it works. Peter told us in the New Testament, do not be surprised by fiery trials. They are coming. Just don't be surprised by them. Don't don't think that something went awry. In fact, the battle that's coming at you is probably a good sign that you're walking with God. I've told you this a million times, but every time it's just good to hear. And if you're new, you need to hear this anyway. Old preacher friend of mine when I was a kid used to say, if you never run into the devil, you're both probably headed the same direction. (laughs) Don't ever forget that. That's just good old country preacher stuff right there. So when we walk with God, the attack's coming. Here's what else I see. Jehoshaphat is now put in a pressure cooker that he's never been in. He thought leading Judah was hard, but now the pressure cooker is turned up, and and it reveals things. Pressure reveals things. And what it reveals for the Christian, among many things, is where your affections are. Now listen, we are affection-driven people in almost every regard. It's how your heart was created. And that's why Jesus said, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. Your, Your obedience follows your affection every single time. And so what we see here is the heat is turned up and it reveals something about us. That's why battles are so valuable. It's why battles are the blessing. It tells you things you need to see. It's an x-ray to your spiritual life that you can't get any other way. And when Jehoshaphat was put under pressure, I love that he's a human. Verse 3 says, Jehoshaphat was afraid. Well, thank goodness, because I was starting to think he, he wasn't even human here. You ever been around someone that you just, they're a super Christian. We had an elder here who passed away a few years ago. He's one of the most godly men I've ever been around. His name was Jerry Roberts, and he sat in all of our staff meetings for years and years. Um, and I just, I often would think, man, bro, I, asked, I would joke with him. I'd say, I know that you're meeting with Jesus in person somewhere. I need to know where. I just want to be there when you do. Is it some tree that y'all sit under? Do you have some spot in the woods? Because he was just so wise, he reacted perfectly to everything. And, and that's kind of Jehoshaphat here. And then we get this. He finds out three massive armies are coming at him, and he's afraid. He's just like us, isn't he? Be honest. How many of you have ever been afraid? You faced a mountain you couldn't climb. You got a diagnosis that scared you to death. You, wasn't sure, you, you weren't sure if your marriage could make it. Your kids were going a direction that you never saw coming. You, the finances just on and on and on. It's life. And I love that it says he was afraid, but here's what, what is revealed. Watch this. He was afraid. And he set his face to seek the Lord. 
Oh, may that be true for all of us, for me, because I'm going to be honest with you. I wish I could say, I'm just like him. But too often what I do is my first reaction when I'm afraid is I just get really worried and anxious and I try to use all the little levers that I know how to pull to make it better, make it work, make it happen. But Jehoshaphat, being the king with all that authority, and he's a wise guy, his first thing is, i got to seek the Lord. Guys, this is modeling something for us. And let me tell you why. Because he turned to God first because he loved God. He had a relationship with God. Do you mind if I tell you all a little love story real quick? Would, would that be okay? Okay. So I'm going to tell you a love story, and it's my love story with, with my wife, and it's just a little piece of it. And here's how this goes. So we started dating in college. And we start dating... And here's something you need to know, and, and don't let her know I'm telling you this. Just let's keep this between us. But my wife had a lot of wrecks. The driving thing wasn't going well. It was all other people's fault, never hers. Okay? But she had a lot of wrecks, and this was kind of well known. And so we start dating, and six months into our dating relationship, she has a wreck. Now, you need to know this also. My father-in-law, my wife's dad, is one of the greatest men I've ever known, one of the godliest men I've ever known. He is an unbelievable man and dad and father-in-law. So he just looms large in the family. And, and so my wife had always, her first call had always been, call my dad. She loves her dad, had this great relationship. Call my dad when I need him. And so she had a lot of wrecks. He was the call she made. In fact, so much so, he was the president of a bank, and he famously told all the workers in the bank, if a call comes in from my daughter, you pull me out of whatever meeting I'm in because she's had a wreck. Like, that's how. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's a true story. This is a true story. Okay. When I married her, he looked at me with a big smile, and he's like, and it's all yours now, buddy. The insurance, good luck with that, you know? Okay. So we're dating six months in, and she has a wreck. Now, I'm not aware of this. This is right, this late 90s, right before cell phone, phones were ubiquitous. And, and so I'm having lunch with a friend, and I, I'm cool, man. I got my, my beeper. Y'all remember beepers? How many of y'all remember the beepers? <laughs> got my beeper. Oh, it starts buzzing. I pull my beeper out, and it's Nan. Call me. You know, all the little things you could do. So I run to a phone, and I call her, and she's crying. And she's been in a wreck. And so I immediately run to my car get to the hospital where they've got her. She wasn't hurt bad, but she was hurt. And... And I go back there, and, and here's what I did. I prayed with her, and we talked, and, and I said to her, I said, hey, you can't be getting in wrecks. You got to be my wife. We never talked about this. And, like, I walked out, and then and our, sto our story is, and she's like, and you didn't bring that up for, like, another six months. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> but the one thing we figured out in that, she told me when I got there, she said, hey, without even thinking about it, you were the first call I made. When I got here, my first call, I need to call my boyfriend. And then she quickly called her dad, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and boy, that meant a lot to me because I was like, whoa, you called me first? And, and here's why, and again, because there was affection. Her affection for me and her trust meant I'm calling, I got to call Chris. And, and in a much bigger way, our battles reveal where our affection is by who it is that we call first. And so many of us run to other things, but Jehoshaphat had this relationship with God. And he's like, the biggest thing in my life is coming at me. I am running to God. That's my first call to make. I'm not going to try to make this happen. His first call was not to his generals and chiefs to find out how many weapons they had. Hey, what's our battle plan? Can we handle three armies? What are we going to do? His first thing was to hit his knees. We need to learn this lesson great trainer friend of mine has a little saying he always says six pack abs are made in the kitchen and I would say winning your battles is made on your knees victories are made in prayer this is so important for us to understand see experiencing fear should lead us to practice prayer it's a sign of our affection it says something who we turn to first that was a big moment for Nan and I to realize, wow, this is serious. This is serious. And then he prays. And he's going to model for us today the way we pray. Jesus will later in the New Testament clarify and teach us basically the way Jehoshaphat prayed this day. So he's got everyone's attention. 
He assembles everyone and he prays in front of them. And the first thing that he prays is theological. The first thing about his prayer you need to see is his theological. What I mean, theo meaning uh, God, logical, the study of God. What this means is he set straight what he believed about God and he did it in front of the people so they would remember who their God is. Jesus will tell us to do the same thing when we pray. Too many of us just think prayers just talking to God. We need to rethink that. You're talking to God. The Almighty, and he told us how to pray. There's great, great uh, direction in how we should pray as believers. And the first thing we should do is make sure we understand who he is. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take piece by piece the prayer of Jehoshaphat and learn from it. Theological, verses 5 and 6. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations and in your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Now that is theology. And the, the reason praise and the reason prayer is so powerful, it's, it's that we are employing human language to declare who God is. We're using human expression that he's given us to say and declare who he is. Listen to what he says. He says, we know, God, you're over all. We got three armies coming at us, but here's what we know. You're over all, including them. You're over them. That's theology. This is what he believes about God. Jesus will later say, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Do you see that? You don't start by asking God for stuff. It's not a genie in a bottle that's sitting in Santa Claus. This is the God Almighty. You start with... I know who you are. And oh, by the way, God doesn't need to be reminded who he is. Prayer's not for you to change him. Prayer changes you. The reason we start with good theology when we pray is it resets our hearts and mind. Because if you're not careful, three armies coming at you may look like it's unbeatable. The cancer diagnosis may put you on the floor. It may, you may think, I can't get through this. The marriage issues may just go, oh, I can't get through. I can't handle this without the theological correction to go, God, you're over all. I got to remember that. Amen, church? And so the first thing he did is he prayed theologically. Secondly, though, he got personal. It's a personal prayer. Listen to this personal language. You'll be able to identify it, verses 7 through 9. Did you not, our God... Everybody say, our God. It's personal. He's not just a God in heaven. He's our God. Drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. This mighty God is a friend to us, and they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house. And cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Listen to all the personal stuff here. It starts with, you're almighty, you're all-powerful, you're over all things, and then it quickly moves to, and you're our God, and we belong to you, and we cry out, and you hear us and save us. So God's not just some far-off, aloof God. Jehoshaphat believes he is with them, and they can cry out to him. We need to be reminded of both. Later, Jesus will say, our Father who art in heaven. He's, he's so big that he's over all things and so close we can ask him for anything. Best news ever. It's personal. Thirdly, after all of that, it becomes a petitionary prayer. He does get around to asking for stuff, and that is absolutely appropriate. In fact, it is commanded. Peter tells us in the New Testament, bring your burdens to the Lord because he cares. Aren't you glad your God cares for you? You matter to him. That's not, again, this isn't cheerleader stuff. This isn't a pep rally for, for the Christians. This is truth. This is truth. You ever been to a pep rally and you're like, this is a good pep rally. We're not winning tonight, but that was, that was really great. <laughs> okay? That's not what this is. This isn't to make you feel better. This is truth you can stand on. When you got three armies coming at you, you don't need to just feel better for a little while. You need some concrete that you can stand on. And Jehoshaphat is convinced that this is the truth, that his God can take out all three of those armies and that even if he doesn't, they will die in front of his house declaring his name and his glory. That's leadership, y'all. 
So he asks. Let's read it. He says, Behold, verse 10, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us now by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. And here's the ask. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? In other words, save us. He asked. When you get your theology right, when you understand that he cares, then ask. Sometimes those first two steps will change what you ask for. If I go through the first few steps, I normally don't ask for stupid stuff anymore. I'm just being honest with you guys. I've never asked God for a brand new convertible Corvette once I go through those first two steps. Lord, you're a God in heaven. Your kingdom is most important to me. I'd love a convertible. That just doesn't work, does it? Now, when I go through those first two, few steps, my heart changes, and I start praying things like, Lord, would you please be near and close with my kids and help my kids follow you with all their heart because that's what really matters to me. Would you bless my marriage so that we can model for the world what it looks like for two people to love each other and serve each other in the shadow of the cross of Christ? You see what I'm saying? Your prayers start changing when you walk through those first few steps. It's a humble prayer, too. It's, it's, it's very humble. I love this. This is He gets real here. Verse 12, he says, For we are powerless against this great horde that's coming against us, and we do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Did you know a prayer that real was in the Old Testament? That is good. We don't have a clue what to even do. We got three armies coming at us. We can't win. We're powerless before them. We have no plan that can win this. So, Lord, first of all, we don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. That's, that's a really good prayer. You ever been there where you didn't know what to do? The family got to a point, you just didn't know what to do. Kids got to a point, like, I don't have any more answers. The marriage got to a point, I don't know what else to do. The doctors are giving you stuff, and you're like, I don't, I don't know what else I can do. This man who's very active in his faith, he's not a lay around, let it happen guy, has run out of answers. And he says, we don't know what to do, so we look to you. And finally, it's a unified prayer. It says in verse 13 that all of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Remember, he made them all fast. You think their kids were all excited about that? They're like, where's our goldfish? <laughs> I'm like, nope, can't have those right now. The little kids are learning. See, Jehoshaphat understood something that the modern church needs to understand. He understood that Israel, Judah, was one generation away from completely getting in left field if they didn't raise kids who understood who God was. And we need to understand that. You want to know how important it is, that kids' ministry that's happening right now? Those ministries that happen here on Wednesday nights for the next generation? is so crucial because the church is just one generation away from getting in left field if we don't model for the coming generation what it looks like to follow God. That's why Jehoshaphat says, bring your little ones. They need to see this. They need to feel this. And then we see that God fights for his people. The big lesson we learned today, you can write it down, is that God will fight for his people. He actually does get involved. He's not aloof. We're not agnostics at Three Circle Church. We're gospel people. We believe that God is so involved with us, he sent his only son when the time was just right, the New Testament says. When the time was right, his son came into this world and gave his life. You don't get more involved in that. It's intimate. It's close. It's sacrificial. He's intertwined. He's in the middle of it. And our God fights for his people. Second Chronicles 20.15, a prophet stood up after Jehoshaphat prayed, and he said, Listen, all Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid. Do not, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. See, once you pray, and you pray like this, and you hand it to God, he gets involved. And you are his people. He said, this is, this is my battle. It's my battle now. And that's a really good place to be. Many of you in this room, you're fighting your battles. Prayer means God begins to fight your battles for you, with you, in you, through you. And here's what I want you to write down today. Prayer and praise unleash power. We come to the final thing right before they're about to fight these three armies at one time. 
And here's what Jehoshaphat, under the direction of God, does. When he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing and the Lord to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. He appointed them, and they went before the army. He sent the praise band in first with guitars and stuff. That's who went first. And he said, here's what you say. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. It's this huge victory in the Bible that they couldn't have won otherwise. And what do we see here? We see here that, that before anything else, we see a man and a nation who prayed and praised And they didn't even know how God was going to work it out. But here's the two things they stood on. The concrete that they built their lives on. We're going to praise and worship the living God, whatever he does. And we're going to pray to him first. He's our first turn we make. Why? Because we love him. Affection. It was a good day at the hospital when I found out that my girlfriend, who was going to be my wife in about a year, called me first. I was like, (laughs) it's a good day. And it's a good day when you and I allow our battles to reveal where our hearts really are. Where do we go first? Today, I would love for you to consider, and at the end of this gathering in a few moments, myself and our whole team, like we do every week, we're going to be here to pray with you. It would be our honor to pray with you over some need that you may have. But ask yourself, Are there things in your life that you are battling and you've not involved the Lord at all? Are there things that you are battling right now that you need to bring back to him and ask him to help and ask him to bless and ask him to have his hand on you? My prayer is today that you would come back, that you would bring your burdens back to him, that you would unleash his power by praising and praying to him because your affection drives you to him first and see that he is faithful and good. Amen.